we've seen that the parties can agree on these uh, elements of the contract, which we call terms. One of the special terms that comes up often is something called a disclaimer. And the way the courts have traditionally treated disclaimers is a little bit different. So we've got a section here just on these special terms, disclaimers. Disclaimers are actually quite common terms. They're also called exclusion clauses or exemption clauses or limitation of liability clauses. And it means that one of the party won't be in breach despite not doing something, despite not doing part of what they've contractually agreed to. So the courts have looked at this and said, look, that seems pretty strange. If you contractually agree to do something, then why would you have a clause saying that you shouldn't do it? Examples of this that uh, include things like you're not going to be liable for any loss or injury or there's no liability if goods are stolen. Okay, So because it's a highly unusual term in the sense that it's going against what you agreed with, the courts have some special rules in place. So three that we're going to look at in particular are that for a disclaimer to be valid, it must be it must be incorporated into the contract. It will be interpreted narrowly and the disclaimer can't be misrepresented if you're going to rely on it. So we've got to deal with each of those in turn. So the first case, Thornton and Shulane Parking, involves a customer going to a parking uh, centre. So the person, Thornton, drives up to the entrance of Shoe Lane Parking's car park and gets a ticket from the machine. The ticket referred to conditions of issue, which were found on the inside of the premises. So the ticket said, look inside for the conditions of entry. Thornton goes into the car park, and when he's in the car park, he's injured. So he gets, has a personal injury. Shoe Lane denies liability because they've got this exclusion clause displayed inside the car park on a pillar that was referred to on the ticket that says that they won't be liable for any injuries. The court held here was that Shoe Lane Parking couldn't rely on that exclusion clause. Why? Because they hadn't given reasonable notice. Okay, So what had happened is they gave notice about the exclusion clause after Thornton had entered the contract. Right? You can't insert a clause after the contract's in place. And you'll remember that a contract is in place from, say, a vending machine or a car park when you take the ticket. So when you take the ticket, that's when the contract. You can't have a term occurring after that. And that meant that in this case, the disclaimer was not part of the contract okay? because they were notified of it too late. Now there is one instance when that might not occur and Balmain Ferry and Robertson uh, is an example of that. So what you had in Balmain Ferry was this guy Robertson who used to catch the ferry, the Sydney ferries every day. And so you can imagine that you've got a dock and you've got an entry gate and you know the ferries uh, at the end of this dock and you've got to go through the gate. And it just so happens that the exclusion clause, okay, the disclaimer, is on the other side of the gate. You've got to pass through it. Now the way these ferries worked was, back in those days they didn't have a lot of technology. So what they used to do was just collect a double fare at one point. So when you hopped off the ferry, when you got into Sydney, you didn't have to pay at that end. But when you hopped off in Balmain, right, you had to pay double. Okay, so that's essentially how it worked. And that meant that they didn't have to have two collection points, etc. Okay, because because they were basically under the idea there was no Sydney Harbour Bridge back at that time, you know, you had to use the ferry. So we just collected at one point. So what happened was that Robinson actually went onto the dock, got to the edge, and said, Oh, you know what? I, I forgot, I left something at home and had to go back out. And what this clause actually said was, it said it doesn't matter if you've caught the ferry, you have to pay to get out. Okay, now he got quite upset about this because he said, look, I haven't caught the ferry, why should I pay? And they said, well, hang on, it's in this clause, right? It's in this clause on the, on the back side of this pillar. 
So then he argued, like in Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking, well, I didn't get reasonable notice, right? I didn't get reasonable notice because I didn't read that when I entered the contract. But you know what the court said? The court said it was a high court decision about a one cent ferry fare, if you can believe it. But what the court said was, well, actually, you caught the ferry kind of every day. So that meant you had seen the sign based upon prior dealings. And so Balmain Ferry and Robertson is authority for the fact that you can incorporate a clause like an exclusion clause based upon prior dealings. If you have regularly dealt with the people, it could be incorporated as part of the contract. If we want to incorporate a disclaimer, it can be relied upon if it's set out in the written contract. We know that from Lestrange and Grauco. It can also be part of the contract if it's brought to the attention of the other party by reasonable notice before the contract is formed. If it's after, it's too late, Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking. It can be in the contract due to prior dealings, okay? Balmain Ferries. So if the disclaimer is in the contract, we now have a question about how it's going to be interpreted. And we've got a couple of cases to help us think about this. The first one is Sydney City Council and West. So in this particular case, this uh, guy West parks his car at a car park owned by the council. Now, as part of the car park, what they have is uh, an office, right, where the person and then a barrier to let the cars, so we got the cars here, right? They go out at the barrier. So you get a ticket going in and then you give the ticket back to the person who's here and they let you out. So that's how the car park work. Now a term of the contract stated that the council won't be responsible for any loss. So we've got a disclaimer uh, in the contract uh, around this particular car park. But what happens is, that this guy West, his car gets stolen. And the thief gets in the car, gets to the exit here, and tells the person, right, tells the person, I've lost the ticket. And the person says, well, that's a maximum charge of $40. They pay the $40 and they leave with the car. This particular case is authority for something called the Four Corners Rule. Now, in general, when you have a disclaimer, it's read contra proferentum, which means it's read against the interests of the party seeking to rely upon it. So if you can read it two ways, you read it the narrow way, the way that gives the, the most limited view of it. So with this disclaimer that the uh, Council of the City of Sydney are relying on, you could read it two ways, that this disclaimer covered every situation or it only covered the normal operations of the business. And the way it gets interpreted is narrowly, that it only covers losses in the normal operation of the business. And so what the court found here was that because the normal operation of the business is that you hand a ticket to get out, and that the parking attendant had let the car out with no ticket here, that was not the normal operation of a car park, okay? It was not the way a car park normally operated. And so therefore, the disclaimer didn't apply, okay? So again, these disclaimers are read narrowly. Similarly, but differently, similarly, but in, in a different way, Curtis and chemical cleaning and dyeing involved a disclaimer that was written on a receipt. The shop assistant explained that when they gave the receipt back, it exempted the company, Chemical Cleaning and Dyeing Company, from any liability for damage to beads in sequins. Okay, so what you have is the assistant saying it only covers, it's only for beads and sequins. Okay. Now what happened was that the uh, person who'd taken their dry cleaning in Curtis, it actually damaged their clothes, which didn't have beads and sequins. When you looked at the written document, it actually was a general waiver 
for any damage. So what we have was a conflict between this general statement and what the person was told. Now, if we go back to that idea that we had from the parole evidence rule, well, you normally go, well, the written one wins, right? Hmm, not for disclaimers. Okay. If there's a misrepresentation of the effect of the disclaimer, then you can't rely on it. Okay, so again, it's read narrowly. Misrepresentations are read narrowly. So when we interpret disclaimers, they're read against the interests of the party seeking to rely on it. There are lots of rules around that. We're just gonna concentrate on the four corners rule. If it's not clear, if it's not clear whether the disclaimer protects the business in all circumstances or the normal course of the contract, the court prefers the narrower interpretation. So the ordinary business approach, okay? Even if a disclaimer is brought to the attention of the other party, the disclaimer can't be relied on if the effects have been misrepresented. Okay, so disclaimers are a special case of terms that are read quite narrowly. They've got to be in the contract, so there has to be reasonable notice of the, t of the disclaimer. They're read narrowly, remember the four corners rule, and they can't be misrepresented. misrepresented. The last thing we're going to have to do is look at the difference uh, between something that's in the contract, between a kind of term of the contract, a condition, and a different kind of a term of a contract, a warranty. The difference between a condition and a warranty. That's next.